Welcome to High Impact Growth, a podcast from Demagi about the role of technology in creating a world where everyone has access to the services they need to thrive. I'm Amy Vaccaro, Senior Director of Marketing at Demagi and your co-host. Today, I sit down with my co-host, Demagi CEO and co-founder, Jonathan Jackson. Jonathan recently got back from the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland. The World Economic Forum brings together leaders from government, business, and civil society to address the state of the world and discuss priorities for the year ahead. This year's theme was cooperation in a fragmented world. I've secretly always wanted to attend the World Economic Forum, but of course, it's pretty hard to swing an invite. And so I was curious to hear all about it from Jonathan on his return and thought that you, dear listeners, might be interested as well. Enjoy. So you've just gotten back from the World Economic Forum in Davos, and we haven't actually chatted. So this is the first time we're chatting, and I'm just really curious to hear about it. What was it like? Why did you go? I have so many questions, but maybe let's start with just the basic of high level. How was it? Yeah, thanks, Amy. It was a really enjoyable event to be able to attend. The last time I was there was back in 2016. The reason Damagi and I attend uh, the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos is because we're part of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. This is a foundation that was set up by the founders of the World Economic Forum, held by Klaus Schwab, that seeks late-stage social entrepreneurs and gives them this award to be part of this community. There's over 400 community members, and I think across the social enterprises they've awarded, nearly a billion lives have been impacted through those organizations. So um, just an amazing group to be a part of, and they invite a subset of those 400 to attend the meeting in Davos and speak on panels and try to raise the profile of social innovation and social entrepreneurs. And we've been really fortunate to to be a part of that community for many years at this point. I felt like an old timer being there, but it was great. And it's so motivating and inspiring to hear the amazing work that that group does. And so a lot of um, what we get to participate in is kind of closed door sessions just amongst ourselves within our network and hearing the amazing work that everybody's doing, some for 20 years like us, some relatively new, was one of the more inspiring parts of the meeting. And then, of course, you're an attendee at the broader Davos event, which has all sorts of heads of state and CEOs and and people from civil society, business, et cetera. And so that meeting was was really great to be able to see. I know the World Economic Forum and Davos take a lot of heat, you know, for the elitism of getting together. And one of the things I found interesting was, you know, I, I was reading all the criticism and, and things heading up to it. And it, it gets labeled as this place where a lot of, you know, global elites come together to make decisions on how the world's supposed to, to work. And from my vantage point, having attended and being, you know, part of that community, it's much more about trying to understand the problems we're facing. Like, they're, they're, at least in the meetings I attend, there's not a lot of solutioning per se. It's much more trying to grapple with these multiple crises we have going on concurrently. Um, the term, you know, popularly used there was polycrisis. And really trying to wrap your hands around what's going on. Because I think the world and the complexity that a lot of organizations are facing, whether they're totally normal for-profit or a social enterprise, is, is increasingly complex these days to understand what role an individual can play, what role an organization can play. And so I really found it interesting to listen to a lot of folks that we normally don't interact with from, you know, different industries and pharma and geopolitical experts on these different dynamics. And so for, for me, it was great. And then there's a specific healthcare vertical that we, we attend a lot of the events with. And that was great to see, you know, a lot of the multilaterals and foundations that we we're able to have a lot of great conversations with while there. That's awesome. That's really interesting. So was your experience like a separate sort of track that they created for the social entrepreneurs, but then you also got to merge with the others or like how did that all play out? Yeah, that, that track is only about uh, four or five hours of like dedicated programming. So it's a, okay. it's a small track that's like the closed door sections I was referring to, but it's kind of the, you know, every industry, every sector is trying to get their message out and social entrepreneurship is no different. So this year was great because there's a ton of panels and content where the social entrepreneurs were placed either specifically um, on the topic of social innovation and, and social entrepreneurship and increasingly more like as one member of a panel also with the CEO of a major company, you know, who are both targeting climate change or environmental justice or, you know, healthcare innovation. So We've continued to see the role that social entrepreneurship plays get more and more prominent at these events. And and I think that's, you know, 
its role in society is also increasing as people recognize the need for, you know, what, what Damagi calls as one of her values, embracing complexity and looking for new solutions to some of these massive social challenges we face. Yeah. So I've been like over the weekend, I was trying to listen to like all the kind of news coming out of it just to try to get a, a pulse and figure out, you know, what to ask you about. And it definitely felt like this is a place where people go to try to get their messages heard. Um, and it seemed like a lot of competing different messages. Um, but I love how you framed that around like it was really not so much about solutioning and solving the world's problems, but to talking about the problems. And I want to hear what was your take on like what were the most pressing problems that were were top of mind? Yeah, I mean, the the geopolitical risk that is kind of outside of the domain of what Tamagi focuses on as an organization, but with, um, you know, the conflict in Russia and Ukraine having no end in sight and no obvious solutions that was talked a lot about by some of the experts I listened to. Um, the one that does affect our work and all of our communities' work that was, um, you know, top of mind for many people is just the looming global debt crisis, particularly in emerging markets. And so there was a lot of discussion on how to resolve that, what parts of this is a debt crisis versus a liquidity crisis. And so I, I went to a lot of sessions by economists trying to wrap our head around this because we know there's, you know, increasing need, dwindling resources, you know, on an actual basis, even if budgets are slightly increasing from local budgets or global donor budgets, that's that's a reduction in real dollar terms, just given the rate of inflation that we've seen. So looking at that, you know, even some of the, the commitments from donors that are increasing year over year funding, it's not actually keeping up with inflation. So in fact, available budgets in real terms are, are going down. So I think that's one of the biggest takeaways and trying to think through what are the potential global frameworks that can help solve these problems and what discussions need to be had. So that was a, that was a huge one that affects us. Um, also, a lot of the the talk on pandemic preparedness, I think there's a lot of concern that the, you know, massive disruption we just went through COVID is not leading to the right preparedness strategies at the global level or at the, the country level. That definitely was consistent with what we've seen, unfortunately. So I think as I was talking with folks, I was really advocating for this idea that I've talked about before, where investments in pandemic preparedness and making sure healthcare systems are responsive and resilient and health workers have the training they need and, you know, have better jobs. Investments we make in routine healthcare are the same investments we need to make for pandemic preparedness. We need a strong public health workforce. We need a strong healthcare system, and we need to be able to coordinate and collaborate across country boundaries quickly as the needs arise. So I think that's a, a big area that a lot of people were concerned about is, is we're not making those appropriate investments, um, you know, at, at the end of COVID. And then obviously with global um, recession potentially looming, the ability to have these discussions around making these smart investments is also a lot more difficult than, than when you're expecting economic growth. And what would you say, Jonathan, was your kind of key message that you were trying to get out? You know, we talked about everyone sort of came with with a message. Was that sort of the key message around really leveraging these pandemic preparedness efforts and trying to make sure that they're actually really focused on primary health care and like strengthening health systems? Or talk me through kind of your your POV and like what you wanted to be getting out of it. Yeah, that's a great question, Amy. And I, for us, we had a lot of discussions with multilaterals and and um global foundations and organizations. The message I really wanted to talk to folks about is aligned to our five-year strategy and our first priority, which is better jobs for better outcomes. So as we look at this, you know, inherently more complex, more crisis-ridden global environment we're heading into, I think it's more important than ever that we're looking at the frontline providers across all industries. But, you know, we were specifically primarily talking about healthcare and my discussions and making sure we're on a path to creating better jobs and better outlooks for these jobs such that these people who are absolutely critical to solving any of these crises, pick whatever you want, healthcare, environment, social justice, any of these areas where the frontline providers, the people based in communities are absolutely critical to any feasible solution and making sure, you know, from a technology standpoint, a digital standpoint, we're thinking through solutions that can contribute to better jobs that can then contribute to better outcomes. So we have a specific you know, approach that we're looking at that unlocks the potential of these workforces that you'll hear more about this year. And that was a lot of what my advocacy angle was, is really ensuring that people are focused on how are we creating better jobs? You know, how are we making sure that these frontline providers want this job today, that this job is better tomorrow, and that we're drawing more people into this workforce? Love that. And was that message resonating? What kind of response did you get as you were in conversations with folks? And also, were you 
hearing those kinds of similar messages from from others as well? Or was this like a pretty bold new take? You know, it was it was really refreshing because we got a really strong, positive reaction to it. And I don't feel like it's something that everybody's talking about or everybody's saying. Like, it felt like we had a pretty unique point of view to be focused on making sure we have better jobs. There's a ton of people focused on improving the consumer experience and saying, you know, consumer-oriented healthcare, consumer-oriented agriculture, and these things. I'm totally on board with that as well. But our focus on better jobs for these frontline providers, I think, was relatively unique and resonated a lot once we started talking with folks and saying, well, like, you know, if, if people don't want this job, what's the end game here of how you improve a frontline program? And again, you know, we've talked about this, but one of the beautiful aspects of this explosion of AI and technology, which everybody was talking about, right, is when these new technologies are leveraged appropriately to support building a responsive and adaptive workforce, I think there's huge potential for technology. And that's where we're I'm trying to focus. Obviously, there's tons of downside. Like, I think one of the obvious concerns everybody was was talking about with respect to AI and chat GPT had just come out and was taking the world by storm at the time of this recording was job displacement and these things. I think it's valid to be concerned if people think, oh, great, now I can replace my worker with this AI bot. I think that's crazy, particularly for the environments that we're in. The job of these workforces wasn't something that was prominently talked about and was something that I was excited to be able to advocate for. And like, I, I'm like optimistic about the potential technology can have to amplify these frontline workers. And that's where we're focused. That's so good to hear. And I, I totally agree. I think it's this idea that AI is going to come and like take all these jobs is, is yes, that's a possible risk. But like really what we need to be looking at is how can AI be better supporting and enabling the people that are most essential to care, um, especially for, you know, 50% of the world that's lacking access at this moment. And as a a side note, with the growing crises with cybersecurity, there was this really interesting speaker that I had an anecdote for, and I don't actually have a citation for what was said, but they said some people ran an experiment where they hacked a researcher's order for genetic material. So these labs that like take genetic material to do all these experiments and CRISPR and, and the ability to edit genomes that is extremely secure. You know, there's all these biosafety regulations, but you can easily infiltrate, you know, somebody who's not that into cybersecurity and like kind of do an attack and phishing to to get them to click on a link they're not supposed to and then change their order. So the actual wrong product comes into the biosafety. And it was just a demonstration of the attack vectors in this increasingly advanced technological world are, you know, pervasive. And thinking about IT security as the reason you're you know, bio defense system is going to fail and what the implications of that are was fascinating. So there's a lot of future thinkers that were also connecting dots that they hadn't thought of before that I found really fascinating. You mentioned that cybersecurity example. Were there any other kind of like wild new ideas or just things that like really made you stop and think and you're like, that's a new perspective I hadn't considered before? One, a social entrepreneur has this really cool um, I think it's called Greystone model that they, they both run themselves and then advocate for others to adopt, which is anybody can walk in the door and get a job. You put your name on a wait list. There's no interview. There's no CV. There's no background check. And it's a way to truly, you know, improve equity and access to these jobs. But also um, their data shows that you're, you're getting just as good of a workforce and you're lowering your acquisition cost for talent and so that was fascinating to me. And then they've gotten other comp- massive companies to adopt these practices. And so like, you know, huge innovations, because we all talked about like, you know, remove the pronouns and remove the names from these resumes. And like, get rid of the resume altogether. I was also in this humanitarian session on response with some amazing speakers from Chef Jose Andreas and Michael from Give Directly and others. And my table was um, interestingly talking about, are we even attacking the right problems, right? Like, are we thinking about the scope of the problem in the right way and then the solutions in the right way. And so I think um, something like just get rid of interviewing altogether as opposed to how do you unbiased the interview, it's kind of like one of those things where you're like, oh, as soon as you hear it, you're like, interesting. You know, like, will, will that work for me? Maybe, maybe not. And like, what, what's the flavor that works at my organization? But the fact that like that's how you tackle that problem is kind of fascinating. Wow, that is, that is pretty cool. Who was like the most famous person that you got to rub shoulders with? Um, that that is one of the the really unique things about being part of the World Economic Forum and and Davos and uh, that you 
meet these people who, you know, are just speaking on a session, you can go up to them afterwards and, and say hi. So there's three examples from the U.S. government that I was specifically trying to meet. One I didn't get to meet with. The first was the administrator, Samantha Power, from USAID. I heard her speak, and she's an amazingly um, compelling speaker. I tried to go to her afterwards, and her staff had to, like, whisk her away to get to our next meeting because she was running late. But two others, I got to meet um, Congressman Seth Moulton, who is an amazingly um, huge advocate for mental health in the United States. And he's also based in Massachusetts, where I live. So that was um, great. And then I met Senator Joe Manchin as well from the U.S. government. But, you know, CEOs of multiple pharma companies and a lot of heads of state from different countries were there. I didn't personally meet them, but I know um, some of my fellow social entrepreneurs had a chance to. So lots of just amazing people there. Oh, I also got to meet Al Gore this time after he gave us a speech on the environment. And part of what is special about that environment is like y you can have a conversation with them without feeling like incredibly awkward. From all the listening that I did of coverage of the event, um, one thing that really came through was like a feeling of optimism. And I actually hear it a little bit in your voice, too. I think before you went, you were sort of like, oh, this is, you know, a little bit absurd in various ways. Um, and now hearing you reflect on it, it sounds like you you really saw the benefit of these people coming together and having these conversations. And it's always better to be talking than not talking, I think. Yeah, definitely. Exactly as you said. I mean, I, I love the World Economic Forum and I'm very fortunate that, that we get to be a part of it. Um, but it is Davos and like some of the criticism is, is valid and warranted. I think what gives me optimism, you know, as you're saying, is is really just the amazing work that I hear about from the social entrepreneurs, from innovators and people trying to tackle these problems. And it's it's so easy to be cynical about any type of conference and any type of dialogue that people are having. But, you know, top to bottom, whether it was a CEO of a company or government, like people are trying to better understand these problems and are trying to solve for them. Like, are they trying to solve for them in their own priority list? Absolutely. A lot of the big businesses are trying to, to figure out ESG because they have to, not because they necessarily wanted to. Popping in with a quick aside that ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. But nonetheless, they're trying to solve it, right? And so there are people really trying to wrap their heads around the problem, look for creative solutions. I will temper that optimism and enthusiasm with, you know, it was really scary hearing from the experts on the global economic outlook and the um, geopolitical conflicts we're seeing, you know, and I don't want to undermine how significant those could be going forward. Obviously, that's way beyond the scope of what we look at as Damagi, but it's something that, you know, it, it is worth tempering that optimism and enthusiasm because while there's a lot to be excited about, there's also a lot to be concerned about. One really interesting fight people had on on climate tech and climate change and, and how to feel about where we are right now. Um, I heard this great summary of saying like, yeah, we're making tons of progress, but the gap gets bigger every year. And so why are people optimistic? And another speaker who was more optimistic said, the gap keeps getting bigger every year because we keep getting more ambitious. And I thought that was an interesting summary of kind of how to think about many things, you know, in, in life of it does yeah. feel like it's widening, like our gap is there. But fortunately, part of that is due to our ambition. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. This is really, really fascinating to hear. And I appreciate you sharing some of your insights because obviously not everyone gets to go to Davos. And thank you for joining. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much for listening. I wanted to share a couple of my takeaways from this conversation. So first is that, you know, criticism of the elitism of the World Economic Forum event aside, I definitely do see value in people getting together to dialogue and share ideas. I liked how Jonathan framed it as really focused on the problems and not necessarily making decisions about all the solutions. Creating space to better understand and discuss the many pressing problems we're facing today definitely seems worthwhile. And I love that point about taking time to question the premise of the problem. The challenges we're facing today in taking care of the world's population will not be solved by the same thinking that got us here. We need to think differently and be open to rethinking even the premise of the questions that we're asking. And that's one way we might be able to imagine a radically different and more equitable future. Second, I want to reiterate the message that Jonathan was sharing there, which is that given the complexity of the challenges we're facing globally, and regardless of what the challenge is, our frontline workforce will be critical to mitigating those challenges. So these can be community health workers, of course, as one really important example, but they're also humanitarian aid workers, agricultural extension workers, healthcare campaign workers, and so many more. These are the people who will be at the front line of supporting our populations through change. 
And we will get nowhere if we can't make their jobs better. We need to be ensuring that our work creating new digital technology to support them actually makes their jobs better so that they can create better outcomes. Third, there was a lot of talk about pandemic preparedness. And I want to reiterate Jonathan's point, which is that pandemic preparedness is great, but the investments that we need to make are actually the same ones we need to make in routine healthcare. And lastly, Despite all the talk about AI and some fears that it will replace jobs, Jonathan reiterated the potential for AI and other advanced technologies to amplify frontline work, not replace it. That's our show. Please like, rate, review, subscribe, and share this episode if you found it useful. It really, really helps us grow our impact. And write to us at podcast at demagi.com with any ideas, comments, or feedback. For example, if this episode in particular spurred any questions, we'd love to hear from you. This show is executive produced by myself. Danielle Van Wick is our producer. Brianna DeRoos is our editor. And cover art is by Sudan Chukang. Thank you.